Hello, what's up everybody? I'm continuing my series on Love 2D Physics. If you didn't see part one of this, I really recommend it because I'll be building on top of everything in that video. Now, I have here my scene from before, but I made a number of changes. Uh, for one thing, I've added a ball object, and the ball has a radius. That's half of its texture size. And here I have some walls. I have a walls table now instead of just individual wall objects. Now the reason for that is because I have five walls and I want to make I want to make them as easy as possible to make. So I created this constructor function right here called new wall and I'm just passing in all my values and it makes the the physics object for me. So it's setting them to static and then at the very end it, in, it actually inserts that into the walls table which you can think of as a walls array. And then right here is where I'm actually initializing my walls. So let's let's turn that on and see how it looks. Okay, well, I got here my scene and as you can see I've got my walls, they're surrounding the scene and enclosing the space. I've got a moving platform now which is my kinematic object. And I've got my crate from last time and now a ball. Now let me push that ball and see what happens. Oh, well you notice there's something funny going on here with the ball. Right? Because it's a little different from, you know, a rectangular object. Let's look at the code. So if we look at the code, I've got a little function right here that actually draws the ball's position. And if we look at that, well, we can see that the ball's position is in the top left because we're actually drawing a rectangular sprite. So we're drawing a 36 by 36 pixel rectangular sprite. And, you know, the way Love's texture drawing function works is it draws everything starting from the top left. But, you know, if it, like I mentioned in the last video, in box 2D, the collider is going to be at the center. We didn't want that for the crate, so we offset it, the collider itself. But, you know, in terms of a ball, we actually do want, you know, the center to be in the center of the ball. Because that's going to make the physics and everything a lot easier. Uh, so, let's, let's just offset that. So, we have here our ball drawing function. And there's a couple things we can do here. So we have, our, we have our ball, which is drawing from the X and the Y, and we can offset that in Love 2D. So we can do a rotation. For now, I'm just going to do 0, and we can do scale 1, 1, and now we have the offset. So that's going to be ball.r, the ball's radius, and the ball's radius. Okay, I think that should cover it. So now if we push the ball, there. So now the texture is being drawn the same way as the collider. All right, now none of these objects are falling or anything. I didn't talk about gravity last time, so let's, let's do some gravity right now. So here we have world and you can set a gravity. You can set the X or the Y. So I'm just going to set the Y gravity, 9.81. Because as we know, gravity in the real world is 9.81 meters per second. And because, you know, down is positive in pixel space, you know, we don't have to do negative. We just do positive 9.81. So let's see how that looks. Well, we do indeed have some gravity, but um, it's very slow. But you can certainly see that there's some acceleration happening there. So the gravity is working, but why is it so slow? I mean, I entered in a real-world value. Well, you may have guessed, but the reason is, is because that's 9.81 pixels per second, not 9.81 meters. And there used to be a function in love where you can set, you know, pixel meters. But they got rid of that, so now we have to do it manually. So I'm just going to do that now. Pixels per meter. We can set our own constant. I'm going to make it 100. So everything is going to move at 100 pixels per meter. So I can just multiply that. Okay. Now let's see what happens. Okay. 
Well, it's much more realistic, I think. You know, things seem to be falling at a speed that's more convincing and rolling indefinitely. Well, there's probably two problems you notice with the ball. Like, not only does it roll indefinitely, but it doesn't seem to actually roll at all. Like, it's not rotating. Now, we can fix that easily. And also, it's not bouncing. So let's fix those two things. Well, the rotation is easy. If we go back here to our draw function. You know, what I was doing is I was getting the position from the collider here in the draw function. And we can also get a rotation. So if I do local rot equals ball.body get angle. Okay, and then we can just set it right here. So that should make the ball rotate. Now if I push that, yep, it's rolling around. And the other problem is the bounce. So to get a ball to bounce, what we need to do is set the fixture's restitution. Why the fixture? Because the fixture holds the circle collider. See right here the, the ball is using a circle collider, not a rectangle collider. So, it doesn't actually matter which type of collider it is, you can do this with any of them, but we, what we do is we do set restitution, and what is the value? Well, it's going to be a normalized value, meaning it's going to be from 0 to 1. So if we do like full restitution, full bounciness, you know, we're going to get a lot of bounciness. Yep. As you can see, it's bouncing. It's bouncing a lot. It looks like it's going to bounce indefinitely, but, um, you know, actually the force of gravity or the influence of gravity is slowing down the bounce very gradually. Uh, so we can make that a little more, a little clearer just by making it more realistic. So 0 0.5. There, much better. Now it actually does look more like a soccer ball, and it will bounce there too. And you probably noticed, like, with the kinematic object, you know, when, when things interact with it, when things collide with it, like, they will not go through the kinematic object, but the kinematic object will not be bumped by other things. You notice that it's going right through this, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> well, it's going right through this block right here. You know, it's not being influenced at all by the colliders. It looks like it's bumping up against the edges of the walls. But actually what's happening is, we look at the code right here. Like it's just checking to see if the position is at the screen bounds. And then if it is, then what it's doing is it's just setting the linear velocity to negative of its x velocity. So it's inverting its x velocity. And the velocity, the initial x velocity is set right here in the load function. So here in the load function, I'm setting the platform's velocity right here. So velocity is constant, right? So it doesn't actually matter if I update it with every frame. So we can just set it once, and then it's going to be the same velocity throughout. And you probably also notice the player is not being affected by gravity. Well, that's because the player's y velocity is always being set to zero each frame. So instead of doing this, if I do, uh, let's see, player dot body uh, get linear velocity. So if I get the linear velocity, and I'm just going to make x zero because I want I want x to be set by my keyboard, right? So if I do that, now the player should be affected by gravity. Okay. And we can do what kind of looks like a jump, but not really. Like, we can jump indefinitely. And the only reason for that is because we're not checking if the player is on the ground. So we have a button that applies a, a y-word velocity, but it's not checking for a ground. So if you just wanted to create a jump, all you'd have to do is find a way uh, to check if the player's feet are on the ground. You know, maybe that would be a good little exercise to try out. But yeah, there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about something important, callbacks. 
What is a callback? Well, it's a function that's called when something happens. For example, like two objects collide and then a function is called. Or two objects are not colliding anymore then a function is called. And you can set that in the world. So if we do world, we can do set callbacks. And we, we can pass in four different functions here. So if we look at Love2D's documentation, there's four main callback functions. There's begin contact, end contact, pre-solve, and post-solve. We're not going to worry about these two. We're just going to focus on begin contact and end contact, because for most games, these two are enough. You know, begin contact is when two objects first touch each other, and then end contact is when they're not touching anymore. So... You know, if you've used Unity, you probably know, like, on collision enter and then on collision exit. It's very similar. So, here in our code, we're going to create some callbacks. So, we actually have to create these ourselves. So, function on collision enter. And you could call that anything you want. It doesn't have to be called that. But the important thing is that you have to pass in some objects. So you have to pass in A, B, and a third one, contact. Now, we don't need to worry about contact right now, but A and B are basically the fixtures of the two objects that are colliding. And we'll do the same thing for on collision exit. So function on collision exit, A, B, and contact. Okay. So now we need to set these in the world. So world set callbacks, and we'll just enter in the names of our functions. So what we're doing is we're actually, you know, passing these functions in like they're variables. So the world is going to call these functions when something happens. Okay. Now we need something to actually happen. Well, I'm just going to do something very simple right here. Local message equals this. Okay, so on contact, you know, message is going to say, like, uh, collided. And then on collision exit, message is going to equal... Well, it's just going to be blank. We're just going to get rid of the message. Okay, and we need to draw that in our draw function. And I've already done this, actually. So, we have here love graphics print, and we're just printing the message to the screen. Okay, so let's uh, run our code and see what happens. And if you look here in the top left corner, we have uh, collided. So, it's a little hard to see because of all the objects in our scene. But you can see when the player actually touches the box, we get our message. And when it leaves, the message goes away. So we set it back to a blank string. Okay, I mean, that's all cool and everything, but, like, don't we want, like, some more information? Like, don't we want to know which two objects are colliding? Like, if the player collides with a wall, or an enemy collides with a bullet, or the player collides with a bullet? You know, we want something to happen, right, depending on the object. Well, for that, we have something called user data. So, let's look at that right now, user data. And... Um, user data is something you set in the fixture. So if we go back here to the player's fixture, so player.fixture, set user data, and we can set this to anything, like anything we want. We can put a number, a string, like I can say player, or I can actually set it to the player itself. So there, I'm going to set that to the player. And I'm going to do the same thing with the crate. Set user data. Great. I don't know why I keep misspelling crate. Create. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so now the objects are being set as user data. But you probably noticed, like, I have here in each of my objects a property called tag. So tag player, tag crate, tag platform, wall, etc. Now, if you want to use these things in the callback, you, you really have to make sure the object actually has it. Like, um, if you try to use a property on an object 
and the object doesn't have that property, it's just going to crash the program. So we need to do a whole lot of error checking. So, like, um, I know that all my objects have tags, but, you know, do we know if the objects have user data? So we need to check that too. So I can do, um, if, well, we, we can get our user data, so let's do object1, object2 equals A, get user data, and then B, get user data. I'm getting the user data of object 1 and object 2, or A and B, and we need to check if there's user data on them first, so if, okay, let's see, uh, if O1 and O2, then, oops, okay, so now, like, they should both have user data on them. If one of them doesn't, you know, nothing is going to happen, but if they both do, we can say, like, um, we can get the tag. So, tag collided, oops, collided with. Okay, like, very simple, right? We just print the name of the tag of the first object and then the second object. So, right now, only the player in the crate actually have user data on them. So, let's see what happens. Ah, there we go. Player collided with crate. Crate! And nothing happens when it collides with anything else. So just those two things are going to print a message, but you can see we're getting the names of our objects. And we can do the same thing with the ball, too. So, ball ball dot fixture set user data ball. So now it's going to print the name of the balls tag. Player collided with ball. Okay. Well, I think that's progress. Now there's one related thing I'd like to talk about and that's sensors. You can see that everything has a collider on it and the colliders are solid. Well, maybe like you want an area that you can walk into and it will take you to another level. Or you want an area that you walk into and then something happens. Or, you know, maybe you want like a, an area, you know, that sort of thing. But you, so you want a collider, but you don't want a solid collider. Well, that's going to be called a sensor in Love2D. So what we do is we take the fixture and we set it as a sensor. So I'm going to do that right now. I'm just going to take one of the walls. Let's see. Um, one, two, three, four. I'm going to take wall number four. So we have our walls object, number four, uh, fixture, and set sensor to true. I can't remember exactly which one that is. Uh, I think that's the one on the right. Oh, uh, that's this one right here. Well, nothing... Well, we can see that the player's walking through it. I need to also set the user data. So I'm setting user data to itself. Let's see what happens. Crate collided with wall. So when it entered it, it did that. See? Player collided with wall. So they're still colliding, but now it's not solid anymore. So that's very useful. You can create triggers and things like that. Okay, good. Well, there's much more in terms of, of Love 2D physics to talk about. You know, I think next time I'm going to talk about acceleration and creating vehicles. I think that will be very exciting. If you found this video useful, like and subscribe. Thank you very much.